Welcome back to another edition of the Friday Show. I'm Ray Pollack, joined by Joe Neville's Bloodstock Editor of the Pollock Report, mm -hmm. and Attorney Bob Helleringer. Yes, sir. Who wrote the uh, book on equine regu regulatory law? Mm -hmm. uh, a catchy title called Equine yeah. Regulatory Law. And yeah, well, the marketing department worked a year on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're pleased that you're with us. Now, we're sponsored by Monmouth Park. You got Twilight Racing Fridays. Saturday and Sunday, uh, 12, 15 post. That's the, they've got the win early pick five, Joe. And I think you, you're a big fan of this bet. Last, oh, yeah. last Saturday, it paid $3,668 and 60 cents on a $50, 50 cent rather, uh, base wager. So that's not bad. Heck of a way to start your weekend. That's right. Well, Bob joined us a few yeah. weeks back to talk about some legal issues. And, and, uh, this past week, there was some news regarding, uh, Ahmed Zayed and Zayed Stables, which is, you know, the Eclipse Award winning owner and breeder of American Pharaoh, currently embroiled in a lawsuit by a lender and then went into uh, Chapter 7 bankruptcy. And this week, a motion was filed by Mr. Zayed's attorneys saying they don't want to represent him anymore because he stopped paying, paying them a few months ago. Uh, and we thought we'd have Bob on to just talk a little bit about the legal profession, a little bit mm -hmm. about this case. And I think, Bob, first of all, you 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 have some personal involvement in this case. Is that right? Yes. I told you yesterday, um, just in the interest of full disclosure, um, I represent in Kentucky, uh, Rudy Rodriguez, who I'm sure all the viewers are uh, familiar with, uh, th uh, through his New York counsel, Drew Malika. I'm sure all the listeners have heard of him. If not, if they haven't, he's going to be very disappointed. But anyway, uh, <laughs> we're trying to collect on a judgment against Mr. Zayed for uh, training expenses. And without taking up the rest of this show on that case, uh, the the New York judgment we tried to we did domesticate in Kentucky is obviously put on hiatus when the bankruptcy petition was filed and. But Mr. Rodriguez, through New York Council, I believe Mr. Malika lined up for him, has filed an appearance in the bankruptcy case, um, just so he's tied on with what's going on up there. And so uh, he's obviously a creditor and an unsecured creditor, but he's a creditor. And so uh, I have a uh, roundabout interest in the outcome of, of that case. But but what we're talking about today is kind of generic. So I'm, yeah. I don't think we're uh, going to touch on any attorney client uh, matters. So we can go forward with that over lengthy uh, caveat. The uh, basically he's, he's, he's standing in line with a lot of other people that is to, waiting, waiting to find out if he's going to get paid. So the, the reaction to the attorneys saying they wanted out of this case was really interesting. Uh, I put up something on Twitter and and the, the, just about everybody said, why would an attorney go to work for somebody who's, well, first of all, who who was sued for not paying, uh, you know, for defaulting on a loan and has a reputation for not paying his bills? I mean, there's a lot of trainers that are owed a great deal amount of money. So why would attorneys go to work for somebody knowing that this person owes a lot of other people money? Well, you're talking about the general nature of, of lawyers who uh, have a bankruptcy practice and the challenges that they face, obviously representing debtors. Um, I'm sure if, the, if this law firm could have looked ahead um, and, and seen where this was going, uh, they may not have agreed to represent Mr. Zayed at all or any member of his family or his racing stable. Uh, but uh, obviously uh, hindsight's 2020 and foresight is blind. So I, you know, it is what it is. Uh, from what I've been able to read, um, uh, they got a fairly large retainer and large by maybe my standards, maybe not by New York standards, but, but, uh, they worked that down. Uh, then apparently they came to some kind of agreement to keep, uh, payment in full on the, their bill within 60 days, uh, which means they allowed them to run two months behind. Uh, that didn't seem to work. So then they got on a, a plan of paying at least 50,000 a month. And apparently that was default. Well, not apparently they're, they're telling the bankruptcy court that it did. So now they're getting nothing. 
And as they pointed out in their motion, uh, they're doing a hell of a lot of work and are going to have to continue to do that work going forward. So uh, at some point, um, you know, somebody in the firm has to make a decision as to uh, how long they can carry a case. And this is not a case that you want to carry. All right. This is a case that could bankrupt you. So uh, in their interest to keeping the lights on at the firm, um, they, they decided to pull the plug, at least to this extent. And I'm sure that was expressed to the client, you know, at some point, if we're not paid, we're going to have to get out. So um, it's, it's at that point. So if they're successful in breaking away from Zayat and the money doesn't show up for them, do they just get in line with everyone else that he owes money to and just kind of hope for some pennies on the dollar eventually? Well, What's his, gonna... sure. his subsequent counsel, assuming he gets someone right. that could take it over, uh, and that'll be a challenge, I'm sure. Um, uh, or if they don't patch up with this firm, uh, th this could be an attempt to do that, to have uh, what we call an attention getter uh, to um, to get back on board. But if, if somebody uh, subsequent to this firm comes in, they could amend the petition to now include, in fact, they have to, to include this other firm as a, as a creditor. So, um, yeah, they could they could be out all this money as well. Bob, I know that your specialty is equine law and not bankruptcy law. That's um, correct. But in in this particular case, the I, I believe it's the trustee in the bankruptcy is making suggestions that Mr. Zayat and his family have uh, quite a few assets in Egypt. And uh, is that is that something that would be untouchable by the U.S. bankruptcy court? Well. From what I've read, um, that is not only alleged, it's, it's um, you know, they're trying to get discovery, mm. uh, which is the phase of a case where you're able to ask the debtor questions. They've had a number of meetings about this. And according to what I've read from the trustee, the trustee is very frustrated because they um, complete answers have not been given to uh, other assets that may be uh, not in the United States. So, um, but yes, I mean, Mr. Zayat's an American citizen. As far as I know, he's he's uh, asking uh, the bankruptcy court to wipe the slate clean and uh, not not pay anybody, basically, that, that's um, not a secured creditor and, and even them very little. So, uh, in exchange for that, he has to be, as any debtor would, they, they have to be uh, extremely forthcoming and candid with everything of value that they have, wherever it is. So, of course, uh, the trustee wants to know about um, they're concentrating on, on bank accounts now and checking accounts and, and uh, other financial transactions he's made with his brother, um, uh, loans that the brother supposedly made to him and and. But yes, tangentially, I can say that correctly, they, they want to know about possible assets that are in other countries, uh, such as uh, Egypt, where Mr. Syed is originally from. So, uh, and they have evidence that, that uh, apparently that he's talked about these assets, uh, even since he's filed bankruptcy, that he has and um, have started to show up in things that the trustee has been able to look at. So. Uh, it's taking an inordinate amount of time uh, to run this down, but uh, that's the trustee's job is to is to discover uh, everything and anything of value that he might be able to parcel out uh, to the uh, to the debtors. So when they said that this case is very early on in its stages, is that what you're talking about? It seems to me like, you know, we've kind of dispersed all of the horses, like there isn't much in terms of the stable itself that's kind of left to piece out? Is that kind of what the next, you know, several months are going to look like? Yes. I mean, the, the trustee um, that was appointed down here in Lexington uh, by the Fayette Circuit Court has done her job and done a very good job of, of locating all the, I'll call them the equine assets and selling those and uh, paying the trainers to continue to train those and, and has a, a, um, um, a total of money that, that she's been able to get and has, has reported that to the, the bankruptcy trustee. So this this is, it's it's early in the case, yet it isn't. I mean, he filed um, 
several months ago, and um, this part of the case should have been over, uh, but it, it can't be until the trustee gets these full disclosures and can investigate to his satisfaction that he has everything uh, that the debtor has and knows where it is and, and has access to it. Now, you mentioned something kind of interesting earlier that, you know, if the lawyers are successful in breaking away from Zayat, kind of wondering who else might step in line for that, what happens if he's unable to find someone else to represent him? Is there such a thing as a public defender in a case like this, or would well, he kind of have to defend himself? He'd have to represent himself. Um, it's not a criminal case right. yet. Um, <laughs> let me say that. Um, and so, um, you know, there's no legal aid society or public defender uh, that I'm aware of. Now, New York may be different. I, I'm my my area of, uh, of knowledge is Kentucky, but mm -hmm. uh, I'm unaware of any provision <clears throat> for counsel that that wouldn't be compensated by the debtor. So, uh, if it if it becomes a bankruptcy fraud case or uh, he's indicted on that and, and has no funds, then yes, he would be entitled to a federal public defender. So, so you mentioned bankruptcy fraud. It, it, the MGG lawsuit includes allegations that um, that he used um, lifetime breeding rights to American Pharaoh as collateral for, for part of the loan. And then the allegation is that they, he sold them, took the money, uh, and instead of paying back the loan, used it for for other for other things. Is that something that could end up going from uh, civil court to to uh, to criminal? Well, not that particular uh, transaction um, because it doesn't impact the bankruptcy case per se. Okay. But um, um, in Kentucky, I you know you could take that I guess to the Commonwealth attorney and say you know it is a crime to um it's fraud basically to take an asset that's that's been pledged as collateral like like if you buy a home uh and the they go to the closing and the and the company that built your home says there's no liens on the property uh, which they have to do they have to sign an affidavit of that effect and then in fact the, the, then they find out there are liens on the property yeah you can have that uh, builder indicted uh for fraud so uh it could get to that range but that's that's on the also eligible list, I'd say at this point. Um, uh, bankruptcy fraud would carry uh, a lot more weight and, and would probably be attempted sooner if, if they have a, have a basis for it. So Zayat's situation is extreme, but it's not necessarily unique in the horse racing realm and people who sort of extend their debt further than, you know, one would want to and people still keep working with them is this something I know your specialty is equine, but is this something that you find is also the case in other fields of work or is this pretty unique to thoroughbred racing and just this sort of well, ecosystem? You know, that's every lawyer's nightmare. You know, the client that comes in and engages you to represent them, they, they may pay a retainer. Um, you get a, a letter of engagement or you get an actual contract with them. They're going to pay so much an hour. Um, and the bills are paid for the first few months. Uh, the case picks up steam. There's a lot going on. Uh, and then the client either can't or won't pay. Um, at some point, the lawyer has to decide if they're going to stay with it and hope that it gets turned around um, financially uh, or gets out. Uh, because they can't afford to carry it. So, yeah, this goes on in a lot of civil cases, obviously. And um, it's a very unfortunate situation for uh, for all concerned, but especially those who are trying to make a living um, mm. and have done a lot of work and maybe aren't going to end up getting paid for it. I, it's happened to me, obviously. Every lawyer's got their horror stories. But one of my favorites is, uh, I did a real good job for a client, got a custody of his kids. I do some family law and, uh, uh, wow, we ran up, a, had a trial, ran up a big bill, you know, and not only <laughs> did I not get paid, but I got eventually a notice from the bankruptcy court here in the Western district of Kentucky that, that he had 
bankrupt, filed for bankruptcy, and of course listed me as a creditor. So I, I just held that in my hand and sobbed silently in my office and remember uh, this fellow's mother weeping in court after I'd done this magnificent job and she was so grateful and we got her grandkids away from this horrible ex-wife and it went on and on and I was just great. And uh, I was so great that they decided to stiff me on the bill, the final bill. And not only that, but to bankrupt it. I mean, that, that mm. just, wow. I mean, but we've, we we have all been there. So, <laughs> so we're, we're we're coming up on the Hall of Fame induction. American oh, Pharaoh is, is nice being... segue into the Hall of Fame. Yeah. So <laughs> is this going to be an awkward induction with with American Pharaoh? Between, you know, I have between, thought about that between I the thought, situation with the Zayat Stable who's and the trainers. represent. I think I'm going to call Drew Malika and see if he can represent <laughs> the, the Zayat family. To which which I know Drew has a great uh, admiration for and uh, and see if he could step in and accept the plaque uh, that, that, that hopefully there's not enough room on there for, for some of all this going on. I, yeah, it's, I, there'll be a polite round of applause and then we'll get right on to the next one, I guess. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, uh, one of the most outstanding achievements I mean, is our sport cursed sometimes? Uh, I mean, one of the most outstanding achievements in, in our sport, and we've had all this to happen. So uh, I don't think Calumet ever had that, you know, when they <laughs> whirl away in citation. And uh, well, these were just very classy people that, that couldn't spell bankruptcy. You know, it just, But actually, when, wow. when Criminal Type was named Horse of the Year, uh, there was a little bit of a of – a, of an incident at the Eclipse Awards when Bertha Wright got up and started cursing out JT Lunday up on the stage. So, wow, wow, Ray, well, your, your memory goes back. I did read that book, and uh, yes, he should have been uh, cursed from, cursed from the stage. Yeah. Yeah, that was wow. Well, I've Forgot got one last question, and this gets back to equine regulatory law a little bit. I was talking more about the Admiral and Mrs. Martin. Uh, they were uh, always referred to going way back. Admiral. And Mrs. Mark, uh, yes. So uh, this isn't the first, he's not the first owner that has, that owes money to trainers. You know, there's a very, you know, high profile case in Kentucky right now with the Ramsey Stable and Mike Maker and Wesley Ward. Is there any recourse that, that racing commissions have when, when someone doesn't pay their bills? Well, you're, now you've uh, another segue, uh, Ray, you're the, the Prince of Blends today. Um, <laughs> Yes, there is a financial uh, responsibility rule in statute as well as regulation here in Kentucky and most racing states mm -hmm. that um, if this situation occurs between licensees in particular, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, the, per the aggrieved person can, can uh, request of the racing commission that they revoke the other licensee's license because they're not financially responsible. And uh, now that does in and of itself doesn't put any money in the person's pocket, but it's a powerful tool to um, if they pull the trigger and take the license that um, uh, might be a, an incentive for the person to pay up um, and and resolve this in some fashion. So, yes, there are there's those uh, regulations are in effect in every racing state and and uh, as far as I know, are would be applicable here you know I've, again that if it's it's almost like you know a person who owes a lot of child support you know technically you can take their driver's license you can mm -hmm. but then you get well okay then he can't drive to work right right you, right. you want the guy working um and the ramses if they have any horses that are any good you know you may want those horses to continue to run so they earn purse money right uh, so do you really want to get their license as an owner revoked? Um, but desperate times call for desperate measures. And, and the kind of money that these uh, trainers are talking about, uh, they may not be too interested in continuing to train their horses and incur those uh, per diem expenses and vet bills and everything else that uh, uh, they may be at that point where they want to, as soon as they get to get a judgment, uh, may approach the racing commission about doing something about that. 
Well, Bob, these are these are great times in the racing industry for lawyers. Uh, <laughs> there is a there's a, well, there's a lot of a lot of billing going on, and we really appreciate you coming on to uh, to help cut through some of well, the. Uh, and another racing publication, which I guess I won't mention on your show, uh, who has resumed writing and publishing. He had a satirical, I have to hurriedly enter, uh, add that word, uh, leading owner or no, leading money earners uh, so far in 2021 in the racing industry. And he had Todd Pletcher and he had, you know, uh, Steve Asbjusen. Uh, number three on the list was Craig Robertson, who was <laughs> the lawyer for the the hardworking, uh, never never resting lawyer for Bob Baffert, and um, so that should tell you a little commentary on uh, on how much is going on in our game right now with the legal profession. Well, every every now and then, uh, Indian Charlie does uh, does have a good one. So, well, you, uh, I didn't, I didn't mention, that. <laughs> and he's always thrilled when I make an appearance on this show, which uh, is is up to me last time I checked. So hmm. I, I enjoy being on the show. So All right. Well, thank thanks you, so much. And give Eddie a hug for me if you can. Yes, and, yes, uh, I will. All right. Well, Bob, thank you so much again for joining us. And we'll be right back after we take a look at this week's Woodbine Star of the Week. as Jolie Olympic are on the outside as goes to the front with them as they turn Jolie Olympica coming fast on the inside Honeycake tackled by Jolie Olympica battling away is another time trying to run home is also Abby Hatcher tappity tappity and our secret agent Amir Vier and abscond delay but it's Jolie Olympica in front of Scond finishing down the outside like a train it's Jolie Olympica in front abscond on the outside finishing well Jolie Olympica by a length to abscond they have it between them but Jolie Olympica is too good and Jolie Olympica wins by three quarters of scond three to our secret agent third then came tappity tappity Mervia Abby Hatcher Honeycake and the race headed by Saratoga Vision. In Brazil, Josie Carroll is the winning trainer for Fox Hill Farm and the winning jockey, Luis Contreras. Our Woodbine Star of the Week is Jolie Olympica, who hangs on to win the Grade 2 Nassau Stakes on July 24th at Woodbine, going a mile over the turf, hang on by three quarters of a length for owner of Fox Hill Farms and trainer Josie Carroll, who, again, we're hearing a lot of in this segment. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. You know, it's a little bittersweet to see those red and white silks of uh, Fox Hill Farm, Rick Porter having passed uh, recently. We don't really know what's going to become of the stable. There's been no announcement as far as uh, what will happen. This is a this is a, a mare that was out in California with Richard Mandela, and uh, based on press reports, they shipped her to Woodbine because she could use Lasix up there, and apparently she uh, may have bled in her two starts in California this year without Lasix. Jolie Olympica, a Brazilian-born daughter of Drosselmeyer. Uh, Fox Hill Farm has had a good history of purchasing horses from South America, bringing them up to the U.S. and having good success. Uh, Bala Bali, obviously a big example of this. And Jolie Olympi Olympica has done very well in the U.S., never finished off the board in seven North American starts to date. Obviously, last one is a big win here. I believe won a grade three or grade two last year as well. So, you know, really good purchase for them. And glad to see she's still doing good for in sort of posthumously for the stable. And you, you mentioned South American horses. How about the Phillies that Rick Porter has, oh, has yeah. campaigned over the years? Uh, you know, Songbird, Aubrey Grace, uh, Eight Bells. Yeah. Uh, so it's been, uh, he's made a great contribution to the sport. Uh, he's already missed and we'll, we'll see where these horses end up. But uh, Jolie Olympica is the Woodbine star of the week. Joe, what should people do on YouTube? What is the thing the kids are doing these days? They subscribe, they like. What? What? Tell, oh, tell you're them. tagging all the bases here. Please like, share, subscribe. There's a little bell at the bottom below our screen here. Click on that so you get notifications every time the Friday show comes up every Friday morning, and just spread the word. If you're watching this, if you've made it this long in the video, I assume you like us and help us get the word out. Help other people like us too. We like you. Help us. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's going to do it for this edition of the Friday show. Thanks to Monmouth Park and to Woodbine for their support. And we'll see you next week.